Okay, welcome to the October meeting of Oak Forest Amateur Radio Club. Uh, to be honest with everybody, I thought the meeting was next weekend, and I hadn't planned a presentation for today. So, uh, put on my thinking hat and said, hey, we're all doing something, or ought to be, learning, building, mentoring, something. So I figured we could use that today as, as our, uh, our topic, but we do have a little business. First of all, the thing that's on everybody's mind, just burning a hole through your head, are we having a December dinner? Yes. December 11th at 2.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon, not in the morning, oh. at Spaghetti Western. Now I have already reserved the room for 20 people. I told them we may have more, but I will give them a call back and let them know if we need to increase it. Because they, yes, Spaghetti Western Restaurant on Shepherd. So uh, I'll send it out as a blast the reflector, give you a heads up how many people are coming so I can call the restaurant and make sure we got plenty of chairs. I don't know if I have tables for everybody, but I'll try and get chairs. Uh, what time on the 11th? 2.30 uh, to 4.30. For those that run eight to o'clock, <laughs> yeah. Uh, now we've got a few items. No, that's the wrong one. First of all, it has been an honor to serve as president. I will not be able to do it next year. All right. So who's going to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> Elections are in January, so be thinking about whether or not you'd want to. A name has been suggested. I will not tell them who that is, Martin. But. <laughs> <laughs> Feed that man coffee. <laughs> no, not till not till after the election. Uh, so think about who you want for the uh, uh, for the officers. Uh, I will send out a list or a description of what each office is supposed to do. Now the main thing for president be the MC. And kind of give a try to give a direction to the club. You know, be the uh, cattle prod when you need to. But mainly, as Hal uh, and uh, Stephen told me, just have fun with it. Uh, let's see. Uh, excuse me. Mark is tied up, so no uh, membership or transfer report at this point. Uh, Donald, do you have anything that any? Uh, uh, Correspondence has come in, QS, QSL cards or anything? Uh, no, no, Donald. No. We just had the one that I, last month, nothing sent. All right. And the state has left us alone. Uh, that's always a good thing. Uh, Stephen, I've got some files on here that I'd like to show. Uh, there's one that says 2023 activities. I have taken the liberty of making a short list of things that we know are going to happen next year. It's very short. And then a couple of things we might want to think about or the next president might want to think about. There are things that are, that are big to me. You know, I'll go do them. Uh, not all of them are astronomy. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> radio, they're astronomy. Uh, but uh, they're an excellent place, where, uh, excellent opportunity to gather where people are, especially kids maybe set up a table but uh, before oh let's see I need to turn some what do I need to turn on here you're gonna to need to hook up aren't you yeah I can now while he gets set up here let's go around the room and introduce ourselves that is something that has come out in several uh, ARRL surveys and one of the things that sold me on this club when I first visited was the fact that everybody was welcoming and identified themselves. I'm Ralph, currently president for the next 60 days, and uh, uh, KE5HDF, go. Uh, KG5OIR, Hal, uh, we're here in Midtown and uh, we got a general license. KW5KEN, Tim Lorenzo, I live over here in the rest of the world. Michael? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm Rusty Wilson. I'm uh, WD8JJR. Uh, I haven't been too active lately. I've been taking care of my wife. She's been ill, 
in and out of the hospital four or five times since June. So uh, uh, not too busy with radio, not too busy with the trains, mostly being a caregiver. <coughs> I understand that's a big part of my reason for not doing it next year is uh, help my health issues, my wife's health issues, other family stuff. I just can't give this the attention that it needs. Jeremy. Uh, my name is Jeremy, uh, KG5PYY, uh, Vice President. Uh, I won't be running for president next year. Um, you got a B. No. Uh, <laughs> I, took, I, took on a role, I took on a role with our scouting district uh, starting January 1st that I can't give the time to pres the presidency here, so, um, yeah. All right, uh, Elijah. This is Elisha, uh, otherwise known as Terry, KF5WFB, general licensee, and uh, is a me member. So, uh, anyway, that's me. Uh, uh, Steve, new member, Kilo India 5, Yankee Golf Papa. I tested uh, this meeting last month. And now I'm Welcome. Welcome. Welcome again. Um, I've recently acquired a couple of Yasu FD60s. Um, they're both still in the box, so the adventure is kind of starting today for me. Um, Mark did mention that in the testing process that the availability of getting these from Gigapart is free radio. Um, and he suggested a number of people donate them to the club to pass on to veterans or people who might, might need one. So if somebody, if you, if that would be helpful, I'm happy to donate it. So. All right, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. I think it's a great idea. We just, we're not set up yet. Okay, all right. Yes, sir. My name is Paul, uh, KI5, KGY. I have a general license. Bobby Kosar, KI5, EPT, technician, studying for general. Good. Donald KG5 PFN. I'm a uh, registered agent and I think trustee, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, trustee. I'm Barry Basile, uh, KG5 IRR, and uh, I, I uh, serve the club with maintaining the web page. Very nicely, too. Thank you, sir. Now, as far as being a trustee, that's the guys in prison that they kind of get <laughs> privileges to, right? That's right. Donald? John, November 5, Tango Charlie Bravo. I'm also the liaison to the club to Terry and the uh, Houston local traffic net and the community HF net in the area. Sir. We appreciate it. Yes, sir. Don Davis, KI5, WWD. This is my second meeting with the community after just passing the uh, technician's service. There are a lot of KIs. That's new. Really great. Martin, Martin. Uh, W5XUK, uh, tech license. Uh, I live in the Heights, a busy studying for my general. Good, nice. good. I'm not doing too well at it, but <laughs> you'll get there. <laughs> Gentlemen. JB5, JM, I just watch the door. W5OFD, Mike, uh, Red Cross, on the radio lead, and uh, helping Mark uh, do the test next door. And we appreciate that. I visited with Echo Society at the Red Cross building, uh, I think it was last month. And uh, it was a very nice group, very nice facility. And I'm pleased that the Red Cross is actually giving you all what you need now. They're, they're making an effort. It's uh, got a new CEO. Mm -hmm. And it makes all the difference in the world. It goes from, you know, they're trying versus they're trying. Uh, and then there's Mark. Go ahead. Introduce. I'm Mark. <laughs> WD5 A&M. WD5 A&M, the, uh, the EE coordinator, the secretary, the treasurer, and the programmer. General follow -up. Thank you. You bought one your kid? Bob, she's a nice setup. All right, are we ready? Yeah. Okay, uh, the one that I want. Um, well, go, go for it, right here. No, I'm, I'm, if it ain't there, you got a problem. There it is. All right, knock yourself out. No, don't say that. I might. So no. which, which one is the Well, he's sitting up there. I want to reiterate what I said on Tuesday night at that. 
that somebody was listening to the, uh, the hurricane information on the, on the radio and heard some people talking about their family in, on, on uh, uh, Sanibel Island and that they hadn't been able to get a hold of them for several hours. He heard that report, contacted the rescues and said, and had their name and address, and they went and rescued them. They were, they were in trouble. As I recall, they actually wound up with eight people on rooftops in that area. Uh, the, the, the family in question happened to have a satellite phone and relayed, get this right, the ham up in Maryland, he contacted the Hurricane WatchNet, told him about it, and he was on the, uh, he was on the phone with the, uh, the family members who were worried about the guys in Florida, who gave him, uh, gave him the satellite phone number for the guys in trouble. He gave that over the air to the Hurricane Net, who called the sheriff, who called the number, because they had a, a sheriff had a satellite phone also, got exact coordinates, rescued eight people. The whole deal happened very quickly. Water was rising around the house. So uh, it made national news. It's, it's a good story about even just listening and trying to see hearing, you know, reports. You know, you can listen to weather net, you can listen to the hurricane nets. And you know, I think I thought that was a, it's worthwhile. And people say, how can I help? Hey, sometimes just listening and reacting to something that you think you know might help us is, is, is good enough. So and I think the older of us who went through the you know the novice uh, portion of their, that life is no longer. It might be a few hours there, but it's no longer given. One of the things that was drilled in the novice exam and the novice question was you listen before keying the mic. That's right. That's right. And uh, as uh, both Dom and Hal have commented, I will frequently listen in on traffic net or on Hurricane WatchNet, the Maritime WatchNet, 14.300. That's, that's an interesting one to listen to. And just in case they need a relay. There you go. And you don't have to be a normal relay person for, for that to happen. That's right. That's right. I'll and listen to the Maritime. When they control asks for relays, pop in, even if you're not a normal uh, relayer. How? Uh, you know, we, question came up once about uh, do clubs have a, a, a repeater that they listen to? You know, sometimes clubs set up things where somebody's always listening to some frequency. Now, I know the, the owner is always listening to his, his repeater. I know Wayne is always on one set. Yeah. Seven. But then, do we want as a club to be monitoring a particular channel off and on? I frequently monitor our weekly net frequ uh, frequency. Uh, I know there's always somebody on 9.2 and somebody on 9.4. Uh, this one, well, I don't, uh, other than Wayne, I'm not sure. So I like to monitor it sometimes. Go ahead, Stephen. Along those lines, I think that's a great idea. And that one seven seems to be the repeater that has the most coverage. Everybody logs on to it. That's yeah. where our meeting takes place. So what I've been doing now is whenever I go <coughs> in the car, you know, to, to the grocery store, whatever, just, just go ahead and shine your, you know, let, you, let everybody know that you're on there. W2, w, w, WF, monitoring. So what that gives is, hey, I want to test my radio. Somebody's on there, so I can go ahead and so I can go ahead and talk to him, or or or, or anything like that. It's, it's always good to know that somebody else is there, because otherwise, you're monitoring, but nobody knows you're there. If I'm in trouble, I don't know anybody's going to be there. Hope that Wayne's there, but that's not a guarantee. So he may be out getting tacos. He may be getting tacos in the morning. So just, just announce yourself as a suggestion whenever you get in your vehicle. Now one, of the, one of the things that I have come across, uh, it's been four or five years now, I just listening to the Maritime Net, 14.300, single sideband, and uh, I heard somebody trying, uh, the, uh, the net control was asking for emergency traffic. Nothing heard. It started to go on. All of a sudden, somebody else chimed in. Wait, wait a minute. I've got a relay. We have an emergency. There was a pleasure boat, a private yacht, offshore of Peru. The Peruvian Coast Guard could not hear them. The boat was sinking with about 12 people on board. Somebody in Central America heard it, relayed it to the, to the maritime net, who then contacted the uh, Peruvian Coast Guard. All 12 saved. 
Wow. Something like that happened actually in 2020. Uh, when the pandemic hit, we were safe, stayed in Lima because they closed down the airport. So I started logging on to the local Peruvian radio club. This is in Lima. Now, if you're familiar with the, the South American coast, you have Peru, and then right below that you have Chile. It's a very long, skinny country. Anyway, this Easter Island, and it's about 2,000 miles out in the middle of, it's going toward Polynesia, is what it is. So anyway, so they had an air ambulance going over from Santiago in Chile to, uh, to rescue somebody in Easter Island. Anyway, the reason I'm bringing this up is that we had our net on a Tuesday there. And sure enough, after that net, people are, you know, rat chewing like we do. And uh, all of a sudden you hear this, this contact from, turns out the guys in, in, in the air ambulance that lost their satellite. I mean, they, they, they were, their satellite calm. So they were actually flying without any, any sort of radio control. They contacted their backup on the plane when the air ambulance was, it was called HF but their HF radio on Easter Island was out. So they, they were talking on HF from the air ambulance and they hit Lima because of the geography of it, closer to, 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 to the ambulance. And that's actually how they relayed a message to Santiago Air Traffic Control to tell them, okay, the plane is going and this is your bearing or whatever. So they were able to nab them into the incident. So this actually does happen. I remember reading about that, yeah. Yeah, it made the news in the ARRL for sure, and mm -hmm. local news down there. That's, you know, 2,000 miles of open ocean, and uh, the rescuers almost, beca almost became the ones to be rescued. And it was amateur radio that pretty much saved the day there. Yep. It, uh, okay, this is the short list that I came up with. Uh, winter field day, we know that's an event. Uh, Stephen had talked about he, he would try and organize something on that. Uh, Greater Houston Hand Fest, March 4, BVARC. Uh, I have reached out to BVARC and asked them to uh, provide a table for us. They're providing free tables to any club that wants to have a, a, a table for the club to advertise themselves. Not for buy or sell, just advertise. So we, we'll get some flyers out. We'll, we'll get a, 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 the club banner out there. Just let folks know about us. A, a lot of people don't seem to know about Oak Forest for some reason. We need to let them know, right of the bushes. Field day in June, Hal, I think you said. Yep. So I'll leave that with y'all. Uh, unless whoever comes in as president decides they don't like you, and I doubt that. Uh, a maybe Scott Radio Merit Badge class, three days in September, October, and then testing at the October meeting here. Uh, Jeremy and I uh, talked about this. Uh, kind of loosely, casually, the other day, and he's really interested in doing it. I understand that CTAC, uh, uh, is it CTAC? Uh, no, BVARC had a team uh, that was helping out with a Scout Merit Badge at St. Thomas High School uh, the weekend of Jamboree on the Air. So they did a Merit Badge and they did Jamboree on the Air there. Jamboree on the Air, October 2021, Jeremy and I will be point for the club on that. Uh, this year I could not go out to my health issues, but there was a, there was a, uh, a scout troop at uh, I-10 and uh, Gary Derry Ashford, that's where it is. I-10 and Derry Ashford had sent me a note in, back in the beginning of September that they wanted to visit a radio station and then have Jamboree on the air. And my weekends have been, a lot of them have been tied up with my wife's health issues. So I put out a, a blurb on it. There's a lot of back and forth, a lot of trouble communicating, including the fact that the Scoutmaster would not respond to emails or phone calls. Uh, finally, somebody made contact with them and a, co a combination team from SeaTac and BVARC went out to Brazos Bend State Park for Jamboree on the Air last weekend. And uh, they had 45 scouts, seven, seven radio operators, 45 scouts come through. They had a, uh, uh, as they described it to me, to me, they had an introductory table, a little briefing what's going on, introduced the scouts to the idea, then a little more in-depth information than the radios. And uh, the fellow has, uh, who uh, led that effort 
said that he'd be willing to come out in January to give us a debrief, give a real presentation of what they did and his thoughts on how to improve next time. So I've, I've asked him to come do that. Uh, club dinner, when I wrote this up, I didn't have confirmation. Oh, wait, this is for next year. Next year, next year uh, December. Now, parts in the year, anybody can hold one, go as a group, go as a single. Uh, if you happen to, if you decide you want to do it, just put something out on the reflector and tell people where you're going and when. Along those lines, guys, uh, there's the uh, the, uh, the bee bark uh, stir crazy net taking place Monday through Friday. Oh yeah, and that's a great group. Great that's group. a great group of folks there. And Dave, haven't heard much about Oak Forest, so I've been mentioning about you know, when I get the chance about Oak Forest Amateur Radio Club. Point is, in that back and forth, it turns out that tomorrow, tomorrow at Brazos Valley or Brazos Bend State Park, over here south of the city, there's going to be a POTA activity. So if you remember, Brazos Bend is the one uh, that has got the observatory. So as, as you're driving there between 3 and 6 p.m. is when this activity is going to take place. Uh, you pass the, 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 uh, the little pathway to the observatory, you make a left-hand turn, and you keep on going towards the left lane in something called Elm Lake. Elm Lake, huh? Elm Lake. Stephen, is that um, Anthony Morales, W5LIC? W5LIC yeah. yeah. yes. and Corey. Yeah, okay. I know Corey. Corey. Those guys. A couple of great guys. They really yeah, are. Yeah, I know. They're really quite, they're very committed. They're very committed. They're very, committed. They're very, they're very, committed. very active. And, uh, anyway, so, yeah, so they're going to be setting up, a, apparently, with quite a few radios. Yeah, so I saw the emails. Yeah. So, so there's that activity for POTA. If you want to get your, your toes wet with POTA, find out what Parks on the Air is all about. It's a great emergency preparedness, getting out to nature, especially with the weather the way it is now. I shall be there. Yeah, I'm going to go there as well. Yeah. So uh, unless something really weird happens between now and tomorrow, but I'll, I'll be there. So yeah, between three, three and six or three and seven, but you know, yeah. you can show up a little bit earlier than that even. But if, if you've got a lazy day Sunday afternoon, consider going to Brussels Bend State Park. Dom, what you got? Okay, two things that, that comes to mind, and this is started in the north and the uh, Midwest, Chicagoland area, and expands throughout the United States. There's a thing called winter heat, and this idea is trying to make contact with other folks using not AHS, but VHS, UHS, Simplex. That's a whole weekend affair, isn't it? That's a whole month. That's a whole month. That's a whole month. And so, uh, once I get more information, I'll put it on the reflector. And again, um, and I, what I like about this project is even to new people like next door, they got 50 watt breakage, get the beef antenna, they can participate. This is on Simplex FM. So this is, this is, this, is, this got text written all over it, okay? Second of all, in November, uh, we also, I lost my phone here, uh, Southeast Texas Avenue Club is having a, uh, it's, it's a demo project. It's got elements of parts on the air, GODA, and it's not a, a true GODA station because it's just a city park, not a state or national park. But I'll read the part where it, it, it particularly pertains to this event. A day in the park. CTEC will hold that all, okay, excuse me. CTEC will hold that open to all events, November the 5th, at Studi Park, 1031 Studi Street, Houston. Texas, 7007, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. What that is, is where um, Judy Wood, Judy Moss, uh, Live Oak, I mean, uh, what? Wild, 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 all that, and that, that, look, that park that's in there, that's where Studio Park is, and I can't. Uh, this will be a time to go with this, we're going to have four local stations. Set up, and out of the woods to bring their own portable setup. Uh, something like this, Stephen, you have your, you have your ghost, uh, ghost station, I mean your uh, phone station, so on and so forth. Uh, break, uh, 
In other words, this is a good time to show off your equipment and test your equipment before you go actually go to an activation or an emergency. So that is the idea behind this. Uh, look for our banners to find us in the park. It's not, it's not that big, it's one of the smaller in the city parks. We will monitor 1464 and 504 simplex primary and 444.500 plus 5 megahertz. DL shows of 100 for anyone who needs help finding the park. And part of the event will be we will have uh, directional climbing using a, a pot cutter. So the idea is, uh, uh, I think both clubs, us and uh, County Tech, I think all the clubs are starting to rebuild again. And, I, and two things that Southeast Texas has been good about has been fox hunting and tailgate sales. So, and I know they're cooking up a tailgate sales. And I, I don't know anything, I can't disclose anything else. But the, uh, the idea is, is exposing amateur radio to the public in the place, in the field, not in the building. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Uh, another thing I got down here, this is one of my deals, Pi Day, Museum of Natural Science in Sugarland. Anything having to do with pie, they just celebrate pie. They have a, a, a contest. Who can memorize the most characters? Last year was a guy. Mickey, Minnie, Donald, uh... <laughs> Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy. Uh, the. Uh, uh, a young man who won it last year memorized 100 digits. Good night. <laughs> and uh, then they have uh, little things for the littler kids, coloring in. Like Ralph and Steven. And That's right. Color, coloring in uh, so, uh, picture. It's also Albert Einstein's birthday, apparently. So they have an out little booth for Albert Einstein coloring his picture. They've got a caricature cut out of him, take the picture with him, this kind of thing. Uh, then they have uh, things throughout the museum about the uses of pie and the math for it. Eating and... Hmm? Eating, eating? yeah. Remember, there is a, the, every mathematician has it wrong. They say pi r squared. No. Pi r round. Cornbread r squared. Pi r. Right. Oh, thank you, Mr. Shanks. Sixth grade math. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and, then, and our, a couple of years ago, this is the, I think this is the year before COVID, there was a, some of us was at Sugarland, uh -huh. some of us was in the radio room here at Transstar. You know, and we had some little six-year-old kids just talking, you know, we, I didn't know who I was talking to. Ralph was saying at the museum, there was this lady, she got really interested, she goes, who are you talking to? And he goes, oh, we're talking to well, we're talking to Transstar. We put her on the air, and he enters Homeland Security, <laughs> and she's just about famous at that point. <laughs> and, and it wasn't for uh, 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 a city council member for Sugarland or a uh, major. Chamber of Commerce representative for Sugarland. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, this is what well, I think the other thing is we don't know when we're out in pubs like this who are we going to touch. That's right. And who, who are we going to get interested in ham radio or a case of pie at least still? Mm -hmm. And then not become ham radio operators, but at least it's still. Now, uh, the uh, director down there and I have put together a series of posters. Uh, they can be used for almost anything. I've got some that are geared to radio, some that are just geared to anything that wiggles, waves, or rolls. You, know, that, you, you use pie to describe any of those. Uh, guitar screen, sound waves, the ripples in a pond, uh, ocean waves and all this, they all use pie in the equation, and of course ours do too. So I've got the general, and I've got the specific for radio, and one in the year he's talking about, she said, you know, radio kind of circles the globe, doesn't it? I said, yes, it does. She says, okay, that's our theme. Bring it. So she just turned it over to us. So we had an HF station, a VHF station, we had a little Morse code table with blinker lights and sounders with uh, uh, paper, big paper clips for a key. And the kids are going ape over that. They do. And several folks told mom, now moms, everybody needs to know SOS. 
At 9-11, a lot of people were rescued because they were banging on the steel. Yeah. They were buried in the rubble, they buried on under the steel, and all they knew was SOS. That's all the first responders knew, and they followed the sound to rescue them. And the moms got, got into that and told the kids, yeah, go ahead. So I went and told the kids it's a secret code. Learn the whole thing. I went over to moms and said, moms, all, everybody over here. Yeah, they think it's a secret code. You can learn it soon. You'll know, what the, know what's going on, what they're planning. Yeah. So I handed out all those little uh, pocket-sized cards with, with, uh, with the code on it. Yeah. And I don't know if any of them have done anything with it. I don't really care because it got it out there. You plant the seed. Around me, about that flight is in, uh, but SOS saved me once. So it was a different scenario. I was in Corpus Christi going down the freeway. I was hearing something on Channel 19 on, on TV. Oh. And the guy, there was an 18 wheeler that lost his brakes. He was coming up behind me very quickly. And and the guy goes, well, how, how, how did I know who you are? He said, I'm the truck that's blinking SOS with my headlights. Oh, <laughs> there you go. So, I mean, you can also use uh, lights for SOS. Mm -hmm. The Navy does it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, they asked me why the blinking lights. I said, well, you're at sea, you're at war, your radio transmissions may not be secure. The lights go straight. Oh, that and the flicker fluid. <laughs> the flicker fluid. <laughs> but uh, uh, I've heard that the Coast Guard is starting to teach Morse code again. Don't know for sure, but that, you know, something wants to look it up. To your point, but, um, this is not here, but over in the UK, um, Coast Guard use Morse quite extensively. Um, I've got a similar story to Dom's, but this is many years ago. Uh, I had a boat cross the English Channel about 80 miles into Cherbourg and um, got delayed with a headwind, which meant I was coming into the harbour at night, mm. right, which I hadn't done before. Um, and there are some nasty rocks either side of the harbour if you're not, not careful or rest of it. The way that I got round it, right, I had no radio, no working radio on board the craft, right, was with the searchlight, literally doing SOS. And thankfully, somebody, I'm not too sure who it was, <laughs> picked it up in the harbour in the marina relayed that out to the French Coast Guard who came out and escorted us in. Had that not happened, I very much doubt whether I'd be sitting here today. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm all for Moscow. Absolutely. Last thing I've got on here is the museum down in Sugarland may or may not have an astronomy day next year. Uh, International Astronomy Day is in April, but they like to do it in October because it's a little cooler for them. Uh, they've got uh, Earth Day in April and they have that out at the observatory. But that's another day where be kids around, parents around, gathering, good place to demonstrate what we do. It, uh, they're, they're in gray and they've got question marks. It's, I may do them, I may not. Or more, more than likely, I'll do Pi Day. I do not know the theme yet. Don't care, it's cherry, a fun day. Cherry pie, that's a cherry. Cherry pie. <laughs> now on either of these, if you work in a museum, you've got to have a background check. Yeah. In fact, everybody who was all uh, coming out of the pandemic, they did a deep dive uh, background check on all the existing volunteers. Wow. And they said, it may take a while. Mine came back in two days. <laughs> yes. You know, if you're clean, don't worry about it. But uh, so I'm all clear uh, for either museum. I help out at the observatory and the uh, uh, Sugar Land branch of the museum, which is the old prison building out there. It's a neat building. They left bars in wherever they could. Okay, so I'll put this out as, a, as, as an email blast on the reflector so people will have it. Just think of anything that you might want to add to it, anything you want to request, uh, or if you want to take on something that doesn't already have a, uh, a chair, or if you want to, hey, I'd like to be chair instead of so-and-so, that's fine. Or just let us know what y'all love. You need to do what you want. Now I saved several files for this little stick. Let me see what the other ones were. The stick or the shtick? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. The stick. Oh, okay. Uh, this, I want to just show these. We're, we're moving into the, uh, are there any questions what we've talked about so far? 
Comments? Rocks? No? Okay. Speaking of rocks, the pebble just walked in. How you doing, what, huh? Go ahead, Alan. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, actually a comment. Uh, if there's a way we could bring the other museums in, because I'm, I know I'm familiar with the museum, uh, the Museum of Natural Science, and also the in Museum Herman Park. of Fine Arts. Mm. If any of those could be brought into the uh, Fine Arts, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, BVARC has a liaison with uh, the Museum of Natural Science, Herman Park, but uh, the uh, active, the volunteer coordinator in Sugarland has been promoted to director of Sugarland and the observatory and is assisting with programs at the Herman Park uh, campus of the museum. Yeah. So through her, we've got an end to every, every place. Okay. Great comment, I appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ralph, uh, there was a breakfast conversation that you were, you were not there, so uh, share it with you is that uh, Mark has been talking about Echo Link, and I don't know if you want to give, because uh, uh, some people are having trouble getting on the Echo Link. And yeah. He, uh, you want to bring that up at all about your Echo Link idea? Uh, I'm not sure what the problem is with Echo Link. Um, I, I know that Rusty has always had trouble on it, but the other guys that I hear using it are fine, so I'm not sure what the problem is. I've had an I've had issue here or there where like there was like a limit on who, how many people can get in. There is. There's, a, there's already there's a, there's a four person limit on it. Oh, um, okay. And so um, that I'm not. I, I think that's selectable, but the, the, the workaround is, is I have a, you know, a, a, a computer and a radio, and all we need to do is just set it up to run Echolink, and we can run Echolink to the computer from anywhere in town. So, so at least for the net, at least for the net, uh, the net, you know, we can run an extra node, the Echolink node, and then we, you know, right from our house. So all I got to do is put put it put it together with the cable and the computer. Is there any club resources? We've been talking about that for a while, but, yeah, but you know, Mark, it just goes in the box. Yeah, yeah. but Mark, is there any club resources? Do you need any help from us as a club? Yeah, I got the computer. I got the radio. And all I need to do is make the cable. But it was I, I propose the following. There was a limit of one. There was a setting of the vehicle link for one login. At one point, I think that's when. Uh, Russ was the first to log on, and maybe Jeremy logged on, so they couldn't. But then Wayne kicked it up to four or five or whatever the current limit is. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen more than four Echo Link logons at the same time. Now, having mm -hmm. said that, have, can we just verify that the current Echo Link is actually finally 100% before yeah. we go ahead and set up a new one? Just well, we, well, well, we still have trouble with it now. So, but it doesn't matter. I mean, we can we can always have with with Echo Link. I can link that to any any of the Pam's clubs or feeds. So what would be the ID for that new link? Pardon? What would be the Echo Link ID for that new link? Would it be K five three D? No. So then that could generate confusion. So it doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, yeah, of course it's going to generate confusion. But at least we can get in. We can always tell everyone. And now here's the link that here's the link that we're going to run. So that, that, that was my suggestion, just to, to figure out if we got a problem, we can fix it before we come up with a new solution. But if we want to come yeah. up with a new solution, that's fine. No, we, it, it's a it's a backup. For, it's a it's a, it's a backup anyway. It always sits, you know, where the box sits, and uh, you know, it's good to have a backup anyway. So we know that we can run it any time we want. We're not, you know, we don't have to mess around with the link. It's not working. But it, the node will be under my call, so you know we'll it'll, it'll link to the one side of there. So but sure. when you see it on Echo Link, it will be so the D5A okay. Mm -hmm. and then, okay, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, the custom node number or something like that. So that's what that's what because I can't use his his uh, I can't use his his, his nodes are tied up. Do it, man. Just call it 5552 five, five, so we know 5551 five, 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 five
my nose running on the Omega Peach down in Galveston. Only right now, so um, I would swap that out just for that day. So you already have an echo right now? Somewhere? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. For those of us who know what echo link is but haven't used it and are not that familiar with it, is it worth doing a presentation? Can somebody do a presentation on it or perhaps point yeah. us to some other one? Probably dial one up right now. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, right. but, uh, so who doesn't know about Echo Link? Okay. Not, not enough. Not enough. Who doesn't know anything about Echo Link? I get a lot of Yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. 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 So basically, what Echo Link is is a voiceover ID <coughs> utility that allows you to connect to any either computer to yeah, computer, right. radio to computer. Um, or radio to radio through the internet. And, and there's, a, there's a phone utility. Do we have anybody on uh, have, uh, Zoom? You know, like an iPhone or a, uh, Android phone. Okay. Uh, and, uh, utility that allows you to connect to the internet. Yeah, okay, guys. So, so this is Echo Link right here. It's an application. It's uh, this icon is right there. You can minimize it on the task bar and all. When you go on to Echo Link, you know, in Google, search Echo Link, E C H O L I N K, uh, it'll go ahead and, and give you to the get you to the page, and it's only open for amateur radio operators. So you're going to have to enter your call sign when you sign up for an Echo Link account, so you can download the software. If you it's want. Windows native. Okay. But so, when you've got, it, it, I've, I've used this computer to computer, right? So I understand that. But what I don't get, um, and again, I don't want to waste everyone's sure, time. No, this is important. Uh, it's how it links to the radio and okay. why. It's not Windlink. Well, Echo Link goes through the internet to a node that then puts it into the air. Well, ah, okay. All right. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The computer is attached to the radio. Yes. Okay, that's attached to the, to the internet Wi Fi. Okay. And so what it's doing is this, when that comes in through the software, it's basically just keying the radio. Okay. So it's just as if you had a handheld. You know, where the radio stacks to the computer, you're, somebody is dialing in to the computer, it keys the radio, and then it keys the, the repeater. Okay, that, that's the way these nodes are working. So they're, on, they're basically an RF link. It's just like a um, cross band. It's just almost like cross band repeat. So it's coming in, it's going to a radio, that radio is keying the repeater, just, just as if it was coming in through. So the connection, you mentioned a radio, but I thought we were talking about, for example, your radio. A radio, yeah. Whose radio? Where, yeah. where is it? The radio is where, the radio has to be attached to the computer with the software no, on it. Wait, 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 back up. Back just to... If, if, if I'm at home, I, my radio is fried. I get on my computer, I've still got internet link. Right. I pull up whatever, like uh, KD5QDG-L, that's Which our repeater awesome. link, and it logs me into that node, and then my ra my computer acts just like the microphone on a radio. It is now tied by internet to the repeater radio, mm -hmm. and so I key it, and, and it goes sends a signal into the repeater. It sends a signal out on RF. How does it know which repeater to go to? That's the you tell it. Yeah. You, you, you select it. So hang, hang on a second. Yeah. Hang on a second. There is a separate, there's two radios involved here. The okay. This is not going directly, this is not going into the repeater into the internet. There is a, there is a, a base radio or a little hand, you know, like a mobile radio that at the same frequency as an input to the repeater. That is attached to the computer. So, some, so instead of you picking up the mic right there at the workstation and going into the repeater, that's coming in through the internet through the echo link, okay? And and so you set the node number, you set the yeah. you have the index of whatever, yeah. Yeah. whatever yeah. Uh, setup it is, you dial into that, and then you just do the software, and then that will transmit into the repeater. But there's a separate radio in the computer that is remotely connect that's, that's a RF link that's just not your computer, not, not your uh, radio, Martin, but a separate one, like you said, remote. Right. But so you, that, this would be a repeater somewhere. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you get to it by internet yeah. into this remote radio that then transmits out the repeater. Right. That was the thing I was missing. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. We got there, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, it's, much, it's much easier. <laughs> right now. But anyway, the, all these notes. So the index here, it, it's a little difficult to see, but you have you know worldwide and country. You know you have countries, you have uh, states, whatever. In this case, you have the U.S. There, it's got you know all the different call areas. You look at the index, and then the status of who's on. Who's active? Who's online? There's hundreds of them. There's like 2,500 in the U.S. or 3,000 in the U.S. Uh, you know, last morning that, which is on the wind, the western wind system, uh, one of the net controls is out of Manchester. Yeah. yeah. And uh, some are some are out, out in Kenai. There's one in Houston. Then there's a there's a fellow that chimes on a regular basis down in New Zealand. He's sitting there having his morning coffee usually. At night. <laughs> yeah. He, as I remember, he works nights. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, so you hear people from all over the world on that one thing. And it's, it's during lunchtime here, like noon or one o'clock Eastern time, and you get all the gossip. Yeah. <laughs> all the nonsense. It's, it's it's nonsense. nonsense. Yeah. What, so so what, what's going on with the, with the one seven is the the node, the, you, the, the echo link, link location is not at a woman's house. Okay, it's at some other location and that you can't get to. You have to whistle. So the you know, when it sits in the sits in a in a spot that that is not the best, it's an old setup. And so the <coughs> computer goes goes down or the radio goes down or whatever, or there's some problem in there. So it takes some time to go figure it out. Then depending on the modem and the connection, we have other issues with the connectivity. So that sometimes you can't get in for whatever reason because the the Wi-Fi link is locked up or one of the ports on the link is on the on the Wi-Fi is not working correctly. Some some other problem. We had difficulty with it for some time. So last year it was it was fixed supposedly, and um, but it's still buggy. So what we did what we can do is because. I'm a member of the group that services the repeaters. We can have we have permission to basically go on there pretty much anytime we want and run a link to the repeater and use it for the call. Okay. And so that's that's kind of the plan. We can't solve any other problem with this. But the other thing is is we can use these on other repeaters too. All we gotta do is change the frequency and we can go to triple six, we can go to triple zero, we can go to any triple four. Any of these others that we have permission to, to operate on, and all we have to do is tell them the name of the plants or whoever it is, and then that solves a lot of, that solves a lot of problems for the for the guys like Rusty. Although really Rusty needs an actual radio. I have one. Well, I'm just lazy. Yeah, he has a, he has a has a radio. It just doesn't he just doesn't work. You know. So I've got a young man out of Del Rio that is anxious to hook up with us on our weekly nets. So hopefully we can get that going. I think we can. Rusty, so can matter. tell us how you use Echolink from your telephone, from your uh, iPhone. Uh, it's just a, it's just the uh, Echolink app. Yeah, it's, it's and uh, you know it's configured to uh, use. Uh, there's there's an app for Android and for iPhone. Right, mine's an iPhone app, and it's configured to use a proxy. Uh, a proxy node somewhere on the internet. There's there's a protocol for for searching and finding the proxy, and then I connect to five 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 one, and that's it. It's it's really simple on a phone. It works. Want to check on it? Five 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 one is not logged in at the moment. So that, that answered the question, right? I mean, five 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 one is on the same. 
So a backup would be a great idea if we could set it up. So it kind of down. Call the boss to find out what's going on. Let's uh. Not much more we can do about that today. So rather than beat a dead horse, I want to move on to the idea uh, that I had for, let's talk about our projects. Now, uh, my neighbor that I brought in last month took his test, got his technician, he's been working on some antennas, I uh, tested it once. Uh, he needs to work on his soldering, basically. But uh, one of the things he's building is this one, a lamp cord, uh, Slim Jim. The, this article is out of On The Air Magazine. I download it, I download specific articles from ARRL. As a member, you get one publication by mail, but have, app, uh, have access to all four of them electronically. So I go out, it's, uh, uh, On The Air Magazine, OTA, is, is uh, every two months, so every couple months I go out and take a look. But this is a, is a complete how-to. It is for the beginners. On the air is for the beginners. But I find a lot of nice projects that you know I'd like to build one of those again. Oh, hey, how you doing? And uh, so it has, over here on the left-hand side, shows where you cut the gap in one side of the zip cord. And they, they've had another article like this. It uses twin lead television line how to build a J-pole out of that. So it's really, uh, oh yeah, create the stuff, how to bind it together. Ralph, what issue is that? Uh, let me see. Okay. September, October, 2022. Okay, that's the newest one. Yes, sir. All right, so that, uh, it, it's a nice little article. Complete how-to, step-by-step including some safety ideas like watch your fingers when you're using that utility knife. Be sure you wear chaps while I solder. Yes. Yeah. Or you will be chapped. Uh, I also want to go to... Our web page has how to build a J-pole with the twin lead. Oh, very good. Thank you. Did everybody hear that? The twin lead instructions are on our web page. Now the uh, the other one, this is uh, this is another one that uh, my neighbor's using. Uh, a simple ground plane antenna, and he had so much trouble with it and would not tune in. When I went, to, he's just right across the street. I walked over there one afternoon, and we tried for a while to get it to tune. I finally told him, "Okay, your solder joints are no good." Basically, what it is. So redo the solder joints add about three inches to your stinger, and then we'll be able to cut it down and tune it. Yeah. So he's in the process of doing that. I'm going to go up here to, you take an SO239, basically the uh, panel mount UHF connector, solder on some radials, a stinger, and mount the whole thing in the top of a piece of PVC. And a coax, just goes down through there, you bring it out the bottom, and you hook on. Uh, now it has, let me go back up, here we go. Two meters, 1.25 meters, and 70 centimeters. That'll be my daughter. Yep. I've got to set up a minute meeting, I'll call you back. Uh, now the picture they show has nice straight elements. <clears throat> okay. I have never been called, well I've been called uh, square, but I get that straight size. But uh, I had an old spool or number 14 solid insulated under my desk. So I pulled it out and I found an SO239 in my junk box. So you've been wired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been wired, yeah. The, uh, I cut the, it says 19 and a half inches, 19 and a quarter, I cut it 22. Give me plenty of room to trim it down. Uh, these radials are also 22 inches. Allows me to bend it through, twist it up, and I've got a, a 300 watt uh, soldering gun. That was plenty hot to solder on the radials. 
and you bend them down 45 degrees, that brings the whole uh, impedance to 50 ohms. If they're straight out, you're 75 ohms. So you bend them down at about 45 degrees, brings it to 50 ohms. It works on dipoles too, wire dipoles. Put a little sag in it, brings your impedance down. And so I set this, I ran my coax down through this little stub of PVC, set this on top, and it's about an eight foot long piece of coax, so I get far enough away that I would not be interfering with the characteristics of the antenna. Checked it out with my nano uh, analyzer, and it was uh, at 22 inches if the uh, minimum SWR was at 130 megahertz. Okay, I know that's too low. So pull the ladder over, climb up. I didn't want to disturb anything. Trim half an inch at a time, then a quarter inch, and then just a little nip, about a 30 second to the final cut. I've got it right at 146 megahertz, okay. uh, 1.0 SWR. And it's 1.1 across the whole band, two meter band. Yeah. So what I did was two cinder blocks, the uh, usual two hole cinder blocks, overlap them, but pull them so that I get a spot about like that in the corner between the upper and lower one. And set that down in there and it holds it real nice. That's my test rig. But this is this would be a great uh, emergency portable antenna. You can fold, or, in fact, uh, to bring it here, I just took those radials, folded them down, I can set that inside a piece of uh, two or three inch PVC and carry it anywhere. I'm not going to unravel, you put it on a plane. Good travel or emergency uh, antenna. And with number 12 wire, or, or number 14 rather, it's going to handle 100 watts, no problem. I'm going to build another one for, uh, for 440 megahertz. So that's my most recent project. Between rounding around the garage to find all the parts, assembling it, and tuning it, one hour. I know how to solder, I know how to tune it. If you're a newbie, maybe two or three hours. But it's a pleasant afternoon, you learn the soldering skill, you have a very functional, easy to use antenna. And I've been having trouble with my radio last Tuesday, my base station, uh, two meter, had a horrible buzz on it. I had to turn it off and go to my truck. I finally found the problem. There was some corrosion that set in between my radio ground lead and my ground bus. So I took that ground bus apart. Got some steel wool. It's a piece of one inch PV or uh, uh, copper pipe. Just, you know, burnish it up real good, put everything back on, home's gone. Wow. But uh, I started off with the antenna. Maybe I got a leak in my antenna connectors. Nope, no problem there. So I tested it with this. Fresh piece of coax, fresh connector, no moisture. And still got the home. So, okay, obviously it's at the radio. So, I, did a little, I, I got out my bolt on meter, was looking around, no connectivity up to the ground bus. Mm -hmm. So, took care of that. Uh, now, what I use is a J pole, some homemade J poles for two meter and 440. And I'm not happy with either one of them. I haven't been. There are too many variables to adjust to tune a J pole right. The distance between the legs, the feed point, or how high up is food point, uh, feed point, how far apart are the legs. Too many things to mess with. So I'm going to convert over to some ground plane antennas. Uh, I'll, I'll do that over the winter. So that's my project. I, yes, sir. So uh, you said you tuned it using that nano DNA. Uh huh. So is that the preferred method instead of an SWR meter or? Uh, SWR meter's fine. That's what I use for many years. Yeah. I, got, I had some cable that I, that I needed to check. I went ahead and uh, splurged on a, on a BNA so I could check out the characteristics of the cable itself. And sometimes I use my SWR meter, sometimes I use the BNA. And I have an SWR meter for my HF and one for my VHF, UHF station. So I'm always monitoring, I can look for changes. Yes, sir. A while ago you were talking about using a 14 wire. Uh-huh. What would the 12 do? It did the same thing. It, uh, the 12, 12 will give you just a little bit broader 
you know, the bigger the element, the fatter the element, the, the broader your uh, uh, your SWR, uh, greater your bandwidth, as I'm trying to say. But from a 12 to a 14, not that big a difference. And a 12, uh, or 14 rather, fits very nicely into the uh, center pin of the Nestle 239. And depending on the manufacturer, a four, a, uh, the bigger wire may or may not. Something else on the uh, DNA versus an analyzer, just so you know. Uh, it's, it's, there's a price and a functionality uh, trade off. The DNA is, used to be about $50, but the problem with that, and that's what I've done, and I use it, but to tune my antenna. But the display is pretty small. And if you want to go ahead and change from one band to another, you have to use a pen with a soft tip, and it's, it's sort of cumbersome to come back and forth. The trade off is that these uh, analyzers, you know, the, the, the antenna analyzers that are portable, that are designed for purpose to go ahead and tune your antenna, you just go ahead and put in your SO239 or PO259 connector there. It's much faster, it seems, to just find out where that dip is when you're resting. It gives you a graph so you can see where your dip is. Both, both do, both do. But the DNA is just hard to see. But so you're in the video. The DNA's have four inch screens. Yeah, yeah. Hey. Sure, yeah. I've got the four inch screen for you to see. Does that, that may be part of that may be a solution. Yeah. It's just what the one I've got is one of the early ones that came out. And it's quite small. Yeah. And if you're just wanting to take it out to the field and just tell me what that resonance, what that dip is. Maybe it's a good idea to, to spend a little bit more in it. Those, those analyzers, those portable with the yellow ones, yeah. can run into the 300. So that, that was a field killer for me. Yeah. I went to the DNA, but just be aware of the DNA. At least some of them can have a small one. Well, with an SWR meter, when, when I use them, I hook up my antenna, and I'll tune across the band, and I'll just make note of what it is, what the SWR is at each end, and what the minimum is. And that tells me how I need, need to trim. So, it doesn't give me a hard graph. I have to think about it, which might be a good thing at this age. <laughs> uh, so my idea was uh, anything you're learning, anything you're building, anything you're mentoring. Oh, Al, uh, the other day on the, on the air, so you and several others asked about Ty, Ty Bruner. Uh, I think it was this on the air. At our meeting. Oh, it was on the online? Okay, we had an online meeting yet about Ty. Ty is a young man who has visited here a few times, a couple of years ago. Uh, very nice young man. He calls me about you know, two times a month to make sure I'm okay. But he's just aware that I've got some, I had some surgeries. So he calls to make sure I'm okay. Plus, he's kind of lonesome. He lives with his mom. He got himself a great job working at the Ace Hardware up on uh, Antoine. And uh, he's been exploring GMRS because he's not sure that he's up to taking the test for, for ham radio. Uh, but Jeremy made the comment that he needs to have a mentor close enough that he can have eyeball with him from time to time. So I, I, uh, I looked up, there's a ham radio map, ham radio licensee map, and I know the area he lives in is 77055. So I sent him a map of that area and the link also gave him a link to the GMRS uh, licensees in his area so he can find somebody to mentor him up there. Awesome. So where is that where he really is? He's in Spring Branch. He's like right up there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the work work in the Long Point area. Okay. Yeah, like so like Spring Branch Memorial area. Okay. Right. Who else has got something going on? New pro Ed, Martin. Can I use the computer? Absolutely. Well, wait a minute, what are you going to use it for? The way you said that. Just Google. Just, just, okay. Google. Reset that. Right? Just show you some pictures. Yeah, consider <laughs> the differences in our languages, I wanted to make sure. <laughs> As Winston Churchill said about America and the United Kingdom, yes. two countries divided by a common language. Absolutely. And very right he was. Just give me a second, guys. All right, I'm just going to, this is just a quickie. So that some of you may remember a couple of weeks, or a couple of months ago, actually, Oh, yes. I did a presentation on some uh, on, on my 19 set boat anchor. Yes. All right. Uh, Which is the same radio my dad repaired in Patton's tanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I remember you saying. Um, I'm doing another one. I'm just trying to find a, a good picture of it. Hang on a minute. 
There is a, a, a British brand of radios that are used mostly for, well, they're used for um, amateur radio as well as a lot of marine and military uses. There we go, there we go. And I'm in the middle. This is the one that I've got. Let's see if I can get, no, no, that's not gonna do it. Sorry guys, just bear with me a second. All right, well, I'll leave it. Let's see if that works. Just trying to get a picture of it. Let's see if I can do it. But the Edison have been around for a long, long time. And some of the radios, that's no, not there. Hold on, I have to go back to the small picture. Mm -hmm. But what we're looking at is uh, this beast here. This is a tube radio. Um, it uses what, what are called B7G uh, tubes, which were introduced back in the 50s. Um, still in use today, actually, in a couple of radios. Um, and Edison have it, they, over the years, they've had a whole range of very high quality communications receivers. Um, some of them actually still classified because they're VLF, they're used in submarines or they were used in submarines. Um, so those, um, what do they call it, trailing antennas that they put behind nuclear subs and all the rest of it, well they used to feed into a derivative of one of these. Um, I picked my, it's, it's called an Edison 636, it's one of, just one of their range. I picked it up a couple of years ago. Um, I actually drove up to Oklahoma City to pick it up um, and got it from a, 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 a side of key, which is his wife, um, up there. Um, bought it back and it sat in my garage for about three months. And unfortunately, my wife was doing some work in there and she, uh, there's some stuff on a rack and it dropped onto the glass here. This is a, a glass frontage. Mm. So I thought, okay, well, it kind of spurred me on to actually do something about it. Well. This has proven to be the most challenging job I've done for many, many years. Because to get to this glass, you have to take, this is a front panel. It's actually a, 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 a steel extrusion. Um, and they're very, very well made, by the way, very heavy duty because marine and military use and this sort of thing. So it took me a total, I, I, I kind of kept a record of it, of 18 hours to get this front panel off. Right? So the way you do this is if you take the knobs off, of course, you've got to take the, the, the nuts from the controls off, because these are all potentiometers or switches here. Uh, take this out, and then the trouble begins, because there's one link to the variable capacitor, which is sitting about here. Um, and when you, the, the, the real problem, and it happens with a lot of old radios, is you, this indicator here and this vernier, it's kind of like a vernier scale here, are both done by pulleys and strings and springs. And my God, uh, I mean, really, uh, I, I, I have, you know, my, my wife has said, why are you up, my, my shack's at the top of the house, why are you up there swearing, right? And, and that's why, because I've been doing this. Anyway, I'm pleased to say that about two weeks ago, I finally found, with a lot of help from a couple of, of, of other people and the internet, finally found the, uh, the, the right way to thread this string. So I'm in the middle of putting this back together and uh, once I've done it, um, I, what I'll do is I'll bring the set in so you can actually see it because they're, they're, they're really beautifully made um, and worth doing. That's one. Can I do another one? Sure. All right. So the other thing that I'm messing around with, just give me one second while I find it, and this will, you, some of you will be more familiar with this. Hold on one second. Does that do uh, all veins? Yeah, yeah. It basically, they go from, um, it, it, it's quite wide. It's, um, 500 kilohertz up to 31 megahertz, right? So, I mean, it covers everything. Um, about, I think it's about six wave bands, something like that. Receive only. Receive only. These are all receivers, yeah. yeah. Hang on one second. I'll just, uh, I know that Mark will recognize this. All right. This is a bit, bit closer to home, okay? When I was a teenager, when I first got interested in radio, um, I was given by a friend's father, who actually, quite interesting, he was the UK chief technician for a company called Ampex. Anybody heard of Ampex? Oh, yeah. All right, yeah, good, and we're all old enough to, to, to know it. Well, he was actually part of the team that actually designed the first VCR, the first oh, ever VCR, cool. which is about, was about the size, you can imagine this TV at about that deep, and weighed about, I don't know, half a ton, something like that. That was the first VCR with, with the two inch tape. Yeah. And he was good. He actually built, would you believe, a Vidicon TV camera. Built it at home. Um, and now, I mean, look, you know, we, we, we can do stuff in high res now and, it, you know, we take it for granted. 
But back in about 1963, that was a big deal, a, a really big deal, because the average TV camera was like, you know, that, that size. All right, I was given this. This is a, a BC 454. It's, um, you may know it as an ARC-5. ARC-5 was the generic description. And it's out of a B-17. Um, they were used in the Second World War. Very much more advanced than the British sets, which were like about five times the size. And one of them I bought in a, a couple of months ago. Um, trying to think of frequency coverage. There, there were various models of this. This one, I think, did something like about two megs up to six megs, or it may have been five megs, something like that. But it was, it was basically across the 80 meter band. Um, and it came with, the, the, the sets themselves were usually done in, in sets of three on a rack. They were 28 volt DC um, five. This at the back is the um, is a small dyno motor which actually fits on it. Um, and I've got a, about half a dozen of these. I bought a job lot of them a couple of years ago because what I fancy doing, and this is the project, is that this, together with its transmitter, there's a, a transmitter version of this uh, called the 456, um, is I thought, well, I, it, it might be interesting to actually make a transceiver, right? Because I've got a power, I have an old power supply which is from uh, E.F. Johnson, you remember they, they did CB oh, yeah. stuff, I believe, yeah. So took the power supply from that, stripped it down, um, got a box, which was actually an old two meter transmitter box that I picked up somewhere. And what I'm in the process of doing is putting one of these in, plus its transmitter, only about like yay big, about that long, something like that. Um, I'm undecided at the moment as to whether I'm gonna run it from the dynamotor or whether I'm gonna run it from the power supply. I may actually leave the option to do both. But it's a good exercise in the actually making a transceiver, right? Because these were never intended to, you know, they, they were working together, but there was no actual transceiver there. So you can see here that's the, the dynamo for that. Um, the, there are some interesting parts of it. The way that they used to tune this on the B17 was there was like a Bowden cable, like a, um, uh, like a throttle cable that went in here. And it went to a little control unit about that big and the radio operator in the B-17 would, would do it from there. So what I've done is to strip this out and behind this panel is um, the, there's a very common modification. In fact, Mark was the one who, who steered me towards it um, to put in a volume control, uh, a BFO switch and a headphone socket. Um, and so what I've done is to actually take the cables out and I'm in the middle of making the front panel which is like just a, a drilling and sawing exercise to, uh, to put that together. So anyway, so that's like real radios. None of this transistorized nonsense, as is, <laughs> as is all would choose, wow. okay? So, very nice. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. small motor right which is also a generator okay yeah so basically what it is it's, it's running originally it would run 28 volts dc which is what all the, the aircraft would run on okay so 28 volts in and then it, it spits out correctly 600 270 and 6.3 right yeah dc right um so which is is 
6.3 volts for the tubes, for the, heat, the tube heaters, uh, 275 for the grid, and then 600 for the anodes. I'm going to ask Maria about that. Do you actually have a rotating part in there? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a transformer it's a with a moving part. part. I'm sorry? It's a transformer with it's a moving part. It's a DC no, it's it's generator. It's a generator. Generator. Actually, it generates. It takes in electricity and gives out electricity. No, right. But it, no, it's, it, the 28 volts makes the motor turn. turn. On the other end of the shaft is a generator. There's, there's, there's two of them. There, there's, a motor and, there's a motor and a generator. Both by a shaft. Right, right. yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 well, the electric generator yeah. has a motor to build yeah. the shaft. Yeah. Right. So it's got to turn the shaft. Yeah. Yeah, see, from back then, the, the, this was a quick way of getting around having to build a complicated power supply okay. because this was so, it was small, it could generate a lot of voltage, you know, different voltages, and then also at, at, at different frequencies. So you know, like voltages here and then one will have, you know, 400 cycles or 600 cycles and where it is, you could generate that easily from that without having to do a whole lot of electronics. Okay, cool. So that, that was, and, and these were used primarily in like an aircraft because they were, they were very simple to run and they saved a lot of space. And they were lightweight as well. And yeah, they were yeah, light, yeah. yeah. I mean, mechanically, there was nothing to them, you know. So a couple of diodes and, uh, yeah. and a magnet and, you know, a transformer, and that was it. Yeah. So, but the downside is you have a moving part, a moving shaft. The, the, the dynamotors lasted forever. I mean, they were, the, those things were designed to, to very, very, they were very durable. But it didn't, it didn't matter. matter. It didn't matter because the, the radio itself was sitting in a rack by the, you know, in the back of the aircraft. And you've got four downgrade engines on the wings, so right. it's, it's yeah. a noisy, noisy aircraft, yeah. obviously. So the, the noise, the dynamo to make, you know, when you're in flight, didn't really matter, because you had headphones on anything. Um, yeah. I, but I, I take your point, you fire up one of those dynamos as, at home as I have, and yeah, they're, not, they're noisy, they really are. Okay. Good yeah, it's like, it's like uh, having a uh, drill. Right? Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> you brought in your new go kit. <laughs> Yeah, I know you've been working on it for a while, and you you shrunk it quite a bit. It looks like okay. Well, it's also a little less power. This is some of you've seen before. You've seen the Jackery before. I brought this in like six months ago. The radio here is uh, the BTEC two by twenty five radio. It's two meters for forty. It's only 25 watts, but it's very, very small. Now, the, the problem with this radio is if you run 25 watts, it gets extremely hot. But for, uh, if you're not rag queuing in your car or whatever, uh, you, know, you can get by with five watts, which is basically a handheld, but I mean, you, you kick it in with, you know, with some game, with a good antenna. Uh, five is help, and you can kick up 25 if you, if you want to. The reason why I went with this is number one, the size, and number two, look at this. This is a cutting board. And it's, it's attached with, with high, uh, not cheap Velcro. This is the industrial strength Velcro. And the idea behind this is I can put this in my car, in my truck, I can connect this with this hole here. I can run my seatbelt through here. So I can have something that I can put in my car, take it in and out really quick. This is, wow. this is the power supply. Really quick. And uh, I'm not advertising because this is Houston. Okay. And with it being smaller, like for instance, that, that Steve Park event, I'm going to try putting this on Metro. I am actually going to try and get to that park on a, on a bus. Remember that the, average, the, the larger kid I had for like scouting events at, at the Astrodome? That actually went on bus route 27 to, to, to the LRT line at the Med Center. So the idea is something small and, and for instance, something. Um, you know, small, small event that you're doing a public service event. You don't need a, you don't need an 80 watt radio. Sometimes you do, but a lot of cases you don't. So I, I was, like I said, and the radio, this radio itself is like 125. So I mean, that's the antenna. What's the output? 
Loaded. Pi twenty five. Okay. So I mean, most for Houston. If you're doing an event here in Houston, that's all you need for for a public service event. Now, if you're going, I would not put this in my car if I'm going to Schulenburg. I need my eighty-watt radio, eighty watt radio. But I mean, just for, and then Schulenburg is a little much more friendly territory. But I mean, this is small enough too. Even in the car, go to Walmart. I can put something over it, and, and people, it's less likely it could get stolen. But again, these little radios at 25 watts do get warm. But this one doesn't have a fan. The first generation of these were burning out like crazy. So this is like the third or fourth generation down. But uh, I was bringing, since we don't have access to the radio room, I might make, if I come to, to a meeting, I might bring this down more often. That if we have new hams that just passed their test, I can bring them over here, get them, you know, hey, Wayne, you got some new hands here, can I borrow your repeaters for a second? Sure, you know, uh, let them have at least the new hand, he or she have a chance to, to go on radio. I think that is a very, very yeah. good thing. Uh, that might be something to consider the, uh, the other uh, people that test. Yeah, we try Whatever. to do that, but these guys like escape, right? There's their, <laughs> you know, they're like, oh, yeah, I gotta go, you know, it's like, well, you got the radios ready to go. Yeah, okay. I was like, more, I was like, uh, uh, Joey wanted to play up. So. Well, yeah. yeah, that's another story. Yeah, and and then, uh, two, and then, two, I have watt meters just for throwing off. And right now, this radio is, uh, the Jack is putting out 13.4 watts. Uh, it's 13.4 volts. But, yeah, 13.4, yeah. Oh, and and at most, radio, Peter, what's that? That was not radio. Meter. 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 Where did you make the, the meter? Oh, okay, this is a power works. Power it, works. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's power works, but there's several, yeah. there's several places that sell these now. They're knockoffs. I've got one like that that I use for my field trip for camping, so I can monitor my batteries and my, uh, my consumption, it really helps. And the thing is, guys, guys, is that you would not believe how much power a 100 watt HF rig consumes just sitting there. Because it's, it's charging up the capacitors and everything else in that rig. And remember, our transmitters are only about 60% efficient. So for 100 watts, you're, you're, uh, you're actually having to draw 150 to, to 180 watts to make that 100 watts output. Got to keep that in mind when doing your power systems. Mm -hmm. So how long does your jackery last when you're using this in this configuration? I haven't really tested it. Uh, like I said, I got the jackery uh, like six months ago. And it was for guys for uh, the winter field day event. Right. Yeah. And sealing. And what I... I want to tell you something quick because if you buy the individual component, you got to spend this much money on, on, a, on, a, on a film. You know, the batteries aren't cheap, especially the lightweight uh, batteries, and then you got you know you have to put everything together. I just want to tell you, and I thought this is, and these were just now, but the jackeries, the jackeries have two lines. They have one line that they sell over the internet, whatever. They also make a line that they sell, that you would sell at Home Depot, Harvard, this was the Harvard Free Church. The idea behind the two lines is, uh, if there's a special on the, on the general jacket price, they can't get, yeah, keep on going with the Harvard Free Church. You gotta get your, your, the cheaper price. Probably it's the same quality. It's the same thing. <laughs> Just These have a little bit more power. This one is a little bit more. This is 290. I think the regular one is 240. I'm not talking about price. I mean, you can get them in different power ratings. Yeah, with the price and price. But, 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 I've but, seen other brands too. There's another brand called Yeti that has yeah. something called Goal Zero, you know, for its interconnects. There's, there's, several, there's several different yeah. ones that go up in power. The ones that are really like that can go into that 1,000 <coughs> watt range, you know, those are. Quite expensive. You know, those are 
but these are good. He, like Amazon has these too. Like so there's, there's the, the Amazon version, and then there's everything else. Because I just bought one, and I think I got a two four two forty. Two forty, yeah. And uh, that's the how many amps? It's, uh, the disadvantage is we don't have Amazon power poles, and Alan, oh, kind of yeah. like knocking into heads. Why don't you see more Amazon power poles? Uh, as as connectors, well, like the Eddie's automobiles and stuff. The like Yeti that I mentioned, the uh, Bull Zero, they, they do use yeah. Anderson Power. Oh, they do use the Anderson but, but they use a special yeah. one that's got it's got the on the on the post of the pole. They've got little ribs on them, and they don't work in normal. They don't work with normal power poles. Oh, what, what is it? which one is this? Uh, it's it's an Anderson Power Pole called. Uh, I can't remember what it's called, but uh, Yeti uses them for their interconnects between between uh, uh, solar panels and 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 the device. Oh, the I see. Device yeah. itself. Okay. So they're dedicated for that. They're, so they're dedicated for so that. Plus, so they don't put them side by side. They stack. Oh. And uh, but they got little ribs on them, and it, you got. You know, right. They're purpose built for that. Yeah. yeah. Are, is that is that considered the Zeti type? Uh, design with a uh, stack like that versus the standard. I'm not sure. So, but the question sure. is, is, so you haven't run, you haven't run this down. Basically. No, I have not run it down. They ran for about four hours out there at our, our winter field day. Didn't even touch it. Yeah. And that was running 81, that was the 80 watt radio. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the one I got, I, I, I charged, I would have been using for my drone work. Yeah when I'm out in the field, because it charges real fast. And so it'll take three full-size drone batteries and it'll take four, it'll take four charges, four complete charges of all three batteries out of the one that I got, which is perfect. So, because the batteries only last 20 minutes, you know, each. And uh, it's windy or it's like, you know, conditions are bad where batteries drain down and they're very slow to charge from the, uh, from the car. But from how I got here, to get me out of the bank, there's less than five minutes put this together. So I mean, that's quicker. Yeah. Very you good. just put it in a go box, basically. Yeah. That's basically what you've got to go bag, yeah. And oh. that, is, that is a $10 bag from Goodwill. The college day. Recycle. Yeah, right. Mark those, oh, uh, those powerful Ooh. housings that have the little ribs are called finger. Finger, oh, okay. I don't know what that means exactly. And he dropped him for his fingers in there. That's right. <laughs> uh, anybody else got a uh, idea, a project you're doing, somebody they're mentoring? Anything else going on? Something new? Yeah. The, the only thing I've got, uh, since I'm, I'm moving back from, from Katy to, to Houston into a townhome, uh, I've got it's a four story structure. And I'm going to be challenged as far as an antenna. Now in the, in the past, what I had in the fourth floor, I went ahead and put up my Wolf River coil and just dangled the radials off the side of the building. But what I'm trying now is trying to use wire antenna. So I'm trying to leverage the fact that the radio is going to be in the shack, which is going to be in the fourth floor, and actually have a dipole on the side of the building. If it's black wire, I found out in Haiti that when you string black wire on your trees, you can't see the darn thing. So it should be totally stealth. Just a single, in other words, not along the gutter, but sort of diagonal, sort of like a sloper. Using like a, a number 20 or number 24 gauge? 18 or what? gauge. 18 gauge, 18 okay. Gauge. Real thin. So the only, the only challenge is the dog bones at the end, which I'm gonna get rid of because I'm, I'm not gonna be running a lot of power, 100 watt maximum. So I'm gonna try just using some- yeah, Just some string. Something else just to, to make it less obvious. This Something I found very good for that, at Academy they have a black urethane trot line. It comes on a spool, about a thousand foot on a spool. Some of it is black uh, nylon, some of it is tar coated, but it's cheap and a thousand, it's very strong. Yeah, it's, <coughs> I might go with that. Uh, but since it's a black hole, one leg is gonna be going from the fourth floor to the third floor window, and I'll you know, screw it on there for the outside of the window. The other one, the best I can do is go straight down 
And that's sure. the most obvious element. Hope, you know, the HOA doesn't complain. If you, uh, but if you string Christmas <coughs> lights parallel to it, they'll never see it. But that will generate interference. Mm -hmm. No, 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 you don't turn They'll plug them in. But even the wire itself. Ah, I think. You just make fake Christmas lights. Okay. Use the Christmas light wire as your antenna. Yeah, oh. I, I don't think the people in the HOA will really look for stuff, but I think this black wire straight down, they won't, that, that's, they won't see you know, it. So that's a challenge, and, and I hope to have some and pictures maybe for next time, but that's what I'm looking at. Oh, all right. Magnetic loop. Steve, I think a magnetic loop is that's the way to do this. Yeah, I don't want to even let them know that I have to go. Magnetic loop on your balcony, you know that. That's another option, actually. Talking with Mark, uh, the Mac, Mac loops, I've never worked with Mac loops, but they're intriguing. So apparently they're very sharp. Uh, they're not broadband. Uh, no. Or the parallel yeah. is very sharp. But if it, if it has a controller on it, then it makes it. I saw something in QFC. Device, if it's a capacitor control. Yeah, no, yeah, the, the mag loops, the, the commercial ones, you want, you don't want to build this thing. You want to actually use an automatic, unless you have a controller on it. Because you don't need it. It's a capacitor, right? A big capacitor. Yeah, it's a variable capacitor. It's a large air gap capacitor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, or a vacuum variable. One thing that I saw in QST Magazine that just came to mind, a fellow had a similar issue, very similar situation, and he got some plastic ivy. Plastic ivy. Oh. Plastic oh. ivy from like, like a Hobby Lobby or something, and draped that down, and he had his wire right behind it. It looked like a piece of ivy crawling up the side of the building. And it's plastic, so it wouldn't be proper. Right. <laughs> yeah. Bob Norris told his HOA that his antennas were uh huh. My wire is not really good. My 80 meter inverted V has got a wire for my TV antenna. That's what he told him. That's what it was. They assumed it by it. As president of the HOA, I accept that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Next year is the president doing the bathroom. For the black and black, it will involve some amount of soldering. Can I? Yeah. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Trying to give some tips and advice for the type of soldering that I'm doing in a particular yeah. project, but even so, it can be pretty intimidating if you've never touched an iron before. And I always see some people in the comments saying that they'd love to do these projects, but the soldering is what's holding them back. So yeah, for those of you mind, today I'm going to give a beginner's crash course in soldering, and hopefully convince you that it's not as scary or as difficult to learn the basics as you might be thinking. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do in this video. First, I'm going to go over some basic concepts and some common issues that I see people running into as they're learning how to do this. Then I'll go over some basic techniques for some different types of components that you're likely to run into as you get into this hobby. Then at the end, I'll give some advice for things to look for in the soldering iron when you're going to buy one uh, and some other tools that I'd recommend to go along with it. As usual, check out the link in the description for a blog post. Uh, that's where I'll put links to any tools or supplies that I'll mention. Also, if you have any questions or if you need any help with anything, we've got a Discord server and I'll link to that below as well. Okay, so let's start with the very basics. Soldering is when you fuse together two electrical components using a metal alloy called solder. And by the way, yes, I'm aware that most other countries pronounce the L in the word solder. For whatever reason, we decided not to in the United States. Wasn't my idea. Anyway, that alloy comes in several formulas that are made up of metals like tin or copper or lead. Personally, what I like using is 60-40 rosin core solder. That means that it's 60% tin and 40% lead. You can get it without lead, but I find that a little bit more difficult to work with. Uh, so if you're using one that has lead in it, just make sure that you wash your hands after you're done. It also comes in different diameters. You can get really thick or really thin solder. Personally, I prefer thinner because it makes it easier to fit inside pinholes, and it also makes it easier to control how much you're applying. Rosin core means that the center of the solder is made up of rosin flux. Flux is another important component of solder. It's used for cleaning metal surfaces and removing oxidation and just getting them ready to accept solder and fuse with it. There are a few different types of this as well. Some of them are very thin and basically evaporate as you work with them, and some are thicker, although those thicker ones can leave a sticky residue that is sometimes corrosive, so you'll want to clean that off with some alcohol when you're done. If you're using rosin core solder, then in most situations, you won't have to worry about using additional flux. Although you'll still want to clean off that residue that the rosin leaves behind. 
Flex can be especially useful for working with ribbon cables or tiny pads on a PCB because it'll facilitate better surface tension to sort of pull it onto the metal pads where you want it to go. Now, a couple of common mistakes that I see people making when they're first starting out. The first is that I'm trying to figure out what these people are thinking. I think that the issue is a lot of people seem to think that the goal with soldering is to sort of melt the solder onto whatever you're trying to join together. Almost like you're squeezing icing onto a cake or something like that. That's not the case. Instead, what you're trying to do is heat up both of the things that you're trying to fuse together and then melt the solder into that. Might seem like a small distinction, but it is incredibly important. Because if you do it the other way, if you just kind of dribble the solder onto whatever you're working on, first of all, it's going to be really messy. But you'll also run into what's called a cold solder joint. That's where it might look like the two things are connected, but it hasn't actually fused with one or both of those surfaces. So you'll have an intermittent connection at best, or at worst, no connection at all. The other issue that I see constantly, uh, the old saying, less is more, that definitely applies to solder. You only really want to use just enough solder to make the connection. Sometimes you'll have a good reason to use a little bit more. For instance, on the Minty Pie where the L and R button board connects to the power board, you should make those solder joints a little bit bigger because they're actually kind of physically reinforcing that connection between the two boards. But the vast majority of the time you only want to use just enough to make that connection. If you use too much solder, then you run the risk of bridging whatever you're connecting with some neighboring components. That can be really bad to say the least. So I'll start with probably the easiest type of component to work with, which is through-hole components. You can find all kinds of different components in this form, like capacitors and resistors and LEDs, and they've got these long legs that are meant to go all the way through a circuit board. You find these a lot in commercially made boards, uh, like these giant capacitors on this printer controller board. For some of them, you might have to bend the legs to make them fit into the board, and I'm just using it with some prototyping board here, just to give an example slide it into the pinholes, and then bend the legs outward to hold it into place. Use the tip of your soldering iron to heat up both the pinhole and the leg at the same time, and then feed a little bit of solder onto it. A good temperature to start at with soldering, by the way, is between 300 and 325 degrees Celsius. Take a look at how it all works. Original Medicare alone covers all of your doctor and hospital visits, but you s Oh, nobody hears on And here. that's it. Like I say, really easy to work with, and you can see that I hardly had to use any solder at all. That's kind of the thing that you'll be seeing here, is only use as much solder as you actually need. Another type of through-hole soldering that I've shown a few times on this channel is attaching header pins to some type of board, like this tiny Arduino board from Adafruit. These make it so that you can stick it into a breadboard, which makes it really easy to work with for prototyping. So the easiest way to attach these is to put the header pins into the breadboard so that you have everything lined up and it'll also keep the legs perpendicular with the board. And then just like in the other example, use the tip of your soldering iron to heat up both the pinhole and the pin and feed a little bit of solder onto it. For this one, I'm using a little bit more than I did on the previous example and that's because these are going to be under a little bit of stress as you insert it and remove it from the breadboard. Uh, so you want to make sure that it's got a nice solid connection. I like to do one on both sides and then just go down the line and do the rest. And this is about what it should look like when you're done. You'll notice that the solder extends just a little bit up above the board and makes kind of a cone shape. And I should probably go back and clean up all the excess rosin from the solder on this one. So next up, let's talk about wire. This is the kind of wire that I like to use. It's coated in silicone, so it's nice and flexible, and it's not going to melt from your soldering iron either. It's also really easy to strip. You can do it with your fingernail. And this is stranded core wire, meaning that it's made up of a bunch of tiny individual strands of metal. You can also get solid core wire, which as the name implies, is made up of one giant thick piece of copper in the middle of the wire. I have only needed to use this a couple of times. It's much more difficult to work with. 99% of the time you're going to be using stranded core wire. So the first thing that I want to show you is tinning wires, which is the process of adding a little bit of solder to it to make it much easier to connect to other components. To do this, strip a couple of millimeters of the wire, and then twist all of those strands together nice and tight. Then you're going to heat them up and apply just a little bit of solder uh, just to coat them and hold them all together. And that's it. This is something that you'll find yourself doing quite a bit, uh, so it's a good thing to practice. 
Next, I'm gonna show you how to splice two pieces of wire together, which is, again, something that you'll probably find yourself doing at some point in the future. There are a few different techniques for doing this, uh, but here's how I like to do it. Strip off about five millimeters of both sides of the wire. Twist the strands of wire together, but don't add any solder to it just yet. Then after we're done, we're gonna need something to cover up the exposed wire. I like to use heat shrink tubing, so take a small piece of that and slide it over one of the wires. Obviously, you wanna do this before you connect them together. Now take both halves of the wire and twist them together nice and tight. Then just like with the tinning example, heat up the wires and apply a little bit of solder. Again, as you can see, I'm not going crazy with the solder here, just enough to coat both the wires. You might want to trim it down just a little bit, and then you can fold the exposed wire over so that it's parallel with the wires. Slide the heat shrink tubing onto the exposed part, heat it up, and that's it. Again, this is probably something that you're going to find yourself doing as you get into this hobby, uh, so it's a good thing to practice. Sometimes you need to connect wires to pinholes, like for example if you're connecting a battery to this charging board. To do that, first prep the pinhole by heating it up from one side with a soldering iron tip, and feed a little bit of solder down into there. Then you're gonna to wanna to twist and tin the wire like I just showed you, then heat up the pinhole and slide the wire in from the other side. Now in this example here, I actually didn't feed quite enough solder down into there, so I went back and added a little bit to the back. This is about what it should look like when it's done. As you can see, the hole is completely filled, uh, but it doesn't stick out very much at all. It's nice and smooth. Also, notice that I don't really have any wire exposed on the top of the board here. I inserted the wires all the way into the pinholes so that there's no metal exposed and you can't accidentally short something out. Sometimes you need to attach wire to a board that doesn't have pinholes, so you'll be attaching them directly to pads on the board, uh, like with this retro PSU board from Helder. Really nice battery charging and boost board. So anyway, I'm gonna be attaching a couple of wires to these battery pads here to add a JST connector to make it really easy to connect and disconnect a battery. So first, again, strip a couple of millimeters of the wire, twist it, and tin it, just like you've seen me do now in a couple of examples. Should look about like this when you're done. Some types of wire like this you need to be a little bit more careful with because they do melt unlike that silicone coated wire that I was using before. Then heat up the pads that you need to attach the wires to and feed some solder onto the board right at the tip of the soldering iron. This is about what it should look like when you're done. Just a couple of nice and smooth bumps that stick up maybe a millimeter or so. Then you can heat up those blobs of solder and just kind of insert the wire into them. Having them tinned beforehand makes it so that they should just kind of get absorbed into that blob of solder pretty easily. Notice that I only stripped as much wire as I needed. Beyond just keeping it nice and clean looking, that's really important so that you make sure that you don't accidentally short something out somewhere. Another type of soldering that actually I'm not sure if there's an actual term for it, but it's really popular with the types of projects that you see on this channel. For example, with Kite's Circuit Gym for the Sega Dreamcast VMU shell. Anyway, you'll see pads on a board that correspond with pinholes on a separate component, in this case a Raspberry Pi Zero. And the goal is to melt solder down into the pinholes and onto the pads behind them, thereby fusing the two boards together. I've shown this technique with several different projects on this channel, such as Ampersand's Null 2 project, which made heavy use of it. I'm actually a pretty big fan of that design because it lets you use cheap off-the-shelf components on top of a relatively simple, inexpensive PCB. We also use this technique in the Minty Pie to make it quite a bit thinner because we don't need any header pins. The two boards are just fused directly together. Now this type of soldering is definitely a little more challenging, but I really think that if you practice at it, you can get the hang of it. Now a common mistake that I see with this type of soldering is that people try to just kind of drizzle solder down into those pinholes. That is not going to work at all and you're just going to make a big mess. Instead, like I mentioned earlier, the goal is to heat up both the pinhole and the pad underneath it, so you want to use a finer soldering iron tip that can actually reach down into the hole a little bit for this type of soldering. Don't go too thin though, because then there's not enough surface area or mass to be able to transfer the heat onto the pinhole and the pad underneath it. So anyway, like I've shown in several previous projects, what you want to do is put some solder down into the pinhole and then insert the soldering iron tip behind it. Stick it down in there for a few seconds to make sure everything gets heated up and then remove it quickly. And if you did it right, then there's a good chance that you'll see all the solder kind of settle down into the hole there. 
For this type of soldering, you're definitely going to want to have a multimeter so that you can check continuity between what you just soldered and wherever that pad leads to. Some projects like the Null 2 and the Minty Pie will have test pads on them so that you can test continuity between each pin that you just soldered and that test pad. If you find that you have not made a good connection, uh, then my kind of go-to trick for fixing those is to take a piece of wire, heat it up and stick it down into the pinhole in question and you can kind of wiggle it around and hopefully get that solder to make its way down there onto the pad below. Now you might be tempted to add quite a bit of solder to make sure that it has a good solid connection, but if you add too much then you run the risk of leaking solder onto neighboring pads underneath it. So you need to be careful to add just the right amount of solder. This can take some practice uh, and there are actually some practice boards that I mentioned in a couple previous videos that Helder designed and put up on Oshpark that you can go and purchase directly from them. They're not very expensive and they've got test pads on them, so it is worth getting a couple of sets of these and practicing on them if you're doing a project that uses this kind of soldering. As I mentioned in previous videos, you can spend anywhere from a few dollars all the way up to several hundred dollars on a soldering setup. And I don't necessarily recommend going to either of those extremes. At the low end of the spectrum, you're going to get an iron that you plug in and it heats up, and that's about the only control that you have over it. As you work your way up that spectrum, you'll start to see nice features like interchangeable tips, adjustable temperature, and even hot air rework guns, which can come in really handy. This is the one that I've been using for a while now. It's called the 853D. It's got those features that I just mentioned. It's also got a really handy feature, which is a built-in DC power supply that you can adjust up to 15 volts. Super handy for working on small electronics projects like you see me doing on this channel. It also has a USB power supply built in and a voltage meter as well. It's also got a really nice feature where it'll go to sleep if you don't pick up the soldering iron for a while. It'll lower the temperature until you pick it up again. You can get it for about a hundred bucks on Amazon and to me it's worth it, uh, but if you're looking for something a little bit cheaper, the one that I used before this one is called the 898D. It also has adjustable temperature, interchangeable tips, as well as a hot air rework gun. You can get this one for about $60. Now, a few additional tools that I'd recommend for getting started. First, you're definitely going to want to get a multimeter. It's, of course, useful for checking voltages or measuring resistance, but the thing that I use most often is a beeping continuity check to make it really easy to check and make sure that you've gotten a good connection. Next, a set of helping hands. I'm a big fan of quad hands, but there are other cheaper ones on Amazon that I'm sure probably work just as well. I'd also recommend a couple of things for taking care of the tip of your soldering iron. First, a wire type tip cleaner like this one. As you're working on a project, you'll accumulate some buildup on the tip. One of these makes it so you can clean it off periodically while you're working on something. The other thing that I recommend is a tip thinner and cleaner like this one right here. Basically, when you're done working on a project, you can stick the tip in there while it's still hot and then clean it off and your tip will look brand new when you put it away. These tips do wear out over time, but taking care of it like this will make it last a lot longer. And then the other thing that I'd recommend is a silicone pad to do all your soldering on. Basically nothing sticks to them, including solder. Uh, it's not gonna melt it if it drips on it. And you can get them with these built-in trays to hold screws and things like that while you're working on projects. All right guys, well, that's all that I wanted to cover. Hopefully this was helpful and hopefully it made it less intimidating to think about learning how to solder so that you can jump in and start doing the kinds of projects that I show on this channel. Again, check out the blog post in the description for anything that I forgot or that I need to add and links to anything that I mentioned in this video as well. As always, a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. Uh, that money goes towards paying for website hosting and tools and supplies and parts for new products. Yeah, yeah good one. Um, I've got another essential tool, Steve. Silicon pads to use. A desolderer. You know, a desolderer? Yeah. Yes. A, like a, a little vacuum thing yeah, that vacuum pops thing. up. Yeah, to undo it. To undo the mess you made. Yeah, solder, solder, right, right. or solder, <coughs> right, either one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I use a, I uh, went to Home Depot and got a couple of free ceramic tile samples. I use those to solder on it. Because yeah. not going to, uh, solder drips on it, not going to damage anything. Yes, sir. So he was showing about strand of wire stripping the wire tape from your fingers and twisting it. Yes. If you just pull the insulation off just a little bit, use the ah. insulation. Oh, that's a good tip. Mm -hmm. Very good. And just throw the insulation off. Mark, anything you want to add? Maybe caps or something else you want to use? <laughs> what I use for my for my tray is a aluminum uh, like I'll send the can link tray. Out. You know, like I'll send the link out. It's kind of thick and heavy, and that way I don't burn my desk. And uh, I buy those at like Goodwill and stuff, you know, when uh, you check tiles, you know, curtain tiles, and those work pretty, those work pretty good. So 
and we just go we go the side of us and stick to it, you know, and then if you drink if you have something that's hot, you can put that on there and it'll it'll cool it off real quick. You just got a question about uh, why we should use chaps while we're soldering. Yeah, well the chaps too. So the, the joke is is like I burn my I had a I have a burn on my leg from dropping solder on it from when I wear my shorts. So and now I don't do that anymore. <laughs> The other thing is on the silicone pads, um, I use something called the Silk Hat, which is a baking, it's actually a baking um, pad. And so that works pretty good, but just don't use it for food wrapping. So, there you go. Good How tips. Are passing today? Uh, we had everybody passed and it was real quick. So, Not we're gonna do 30 yet. minutes, start to finish. Two texts in general. And, uh, some text in general. Two texts in general. They, everybody did really good, so, um, and then, yeah, we've got this down now, so in 30 minutes, boom, they're, they're done. So, how, uh, with the new system, I guess, ARRL's uh, testing system, how, how soon do they get their their call sign, or how does that, is, is that, that that's, that's uh, sped well, up, really right? really do, but it's just, they've speeded it up, so, so if I put the test in today, they'll be, they'll post by Monday. When Mark put the test in over the weekend, I got an email uh, from the FCC and uh, asking for payment that Monday. I submitted the payment, uh -huh. and then a day later, I got the license. I mean, wow. it was like, wow. the FCC must be the best government agency. We yeah. have. <laughs> it, it used to not be that way. It used to be a bit longer, but I yeah, think they streamlined it. Longer. IRS can take your money faster. <laughs> yeah. Now, now everything quickly. is automated, so, and then... We, we don't even have to send in the paperwork anymore, at least I don't. So the, the v, for the VEs that have no glitches with ARL, I don't even have to, you know, I keep the paperwork, but then they don't, you know, all they take is the scans. And I'm usually the first one to scan, you know, the first ones on Saturdays to send, you know, of the VE sessions, I'm usually the first one in. And so, um, you know, it's real quick. Do they have a uh, list of uh, how many people have, have tested through OPAR? Well, I have 112 sessions. So whatever that is, I don't remember how many. Probably average about five each. Yeah, they're four to five each with 100, 100 I, th I think I'm at 114 now. And we have 280, we, I, I went back five years and there's 280 people that emails are active on a day base. So uh, 284, something like that. So that's, so that, yeah. Okay, have a recommendation from Mark if you have a cable, they're, they're radio specific, etch into the, this end piece, the type of radio that it's for. Ah. <laughs> Why? Because every time I do it, I do it right. <laughs> I've got uh, uh, an aside here. I just got an email from Jeff Greer over at Mark. He's one of my contacts over there, and they did a uh, Jamboree on the Air event. They talked to Alberta, Irby, England, near Liverpool, uh, Florida, Illinois, Indiana, Italy, Kansas, Germany, Ohio, Michigan, New, New Jersey, Saskatchewan, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and West Virginia. Contacts on four different bands, about five bands, okay, and uh, they had 53 scouts. Uh, he said, well, that's, he says 53 that, that, that he was present for, there may be more. And then several stations in Germany. So uh, sounds like they had a, a good thing going on. Uh, uh, where did they do that? That was at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, Cub Scout Pack 167. So I was, I was telling uh, Ralph uh, uh, Thursday night, uh, I think I had like four different scout groups reach out to me and Ralph asking for a uh, group of hams to help out this year. And I think uh, someone reached out to Mark too, but uh, that's the biggest group that I've had reach out to me and you know, since I've been a ham to do the uh, so yeah. next year, so I, I saw that you talked about that earlier, but uh, maybe next year, you know, we can 
And yeah. I think the key, the takeaway for the scouts is we have to go to them. Yeah. So that's in order to make that work. They're not coming to us. We have to go to Most, them. Usually they don't come to us, no. This is the first year I, I, that I've had any approach us, you know, Jeremy and I. So uh, I think that's all for today. And if somebody's got more business. You know, if we do, or Jeremy, that Carney Arena, or wherever, you know, that arena that they use for the, for the scouting event, and you could have the trailer, and Hans could, you know, the scouts could talk to each other so, in the building. So they haven't had that event since the beginning of COVID, and also the, I, I don't plan on doing that event as a hand again, because, you know, the last time we were there, they, uh, <coughs> they have really screwed me the last time I was there when I signed up for the event. Yeah, they put us right next to the welding demonstration once. Oh. And Metro yeah. Bus. And, and then but, put us between Metro Buses another time. The, the, the last time I was there, they put me between the uh, Scout Camp's horse and the welding and the aluminum building. So I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> without, without any tables or chairs or anything that I asked for from them. So I'm like, nope. So. And, but the, the Jabri on the air is a different event yeah. where, you know, we can put on ourselves and use our own gear that we can do as a, as a club or as a group of people. But uh, uh, let's see, Bevark, CPAC, and Echo all took an interest based on some emails that I sent out. We, you and I got that one, and I sent it out to all those groups, and those four groups all took on a scout group, a, a, a pack or, or, or a troop and did an event, so at least four, including the, the one out of Brazos Bend. So that's great. So next year, let's make it a bigger event. Yeah, find us someplace. Uh, now, after we're done here, when our field day, I got a couple ideas for you, okay? Hey, I got a, an update on the echo link, right there, the talking about me. So the, the, the node is supposedly up and running, but there's some problem with the Wi-Fi. That, uh -huh. And he has it at his house, and the Wi-Fi cuts out randomly for whatever reason. If it's hardwired in the radio, it seems to work, but he seems to think that it's something interference with the, with the channel that he has the thing set on for whatever reason, because otherwise it, it supposedly works. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think what he said, we could, if you want to set up an extra node, he, he doesn't care, he'll help us out. And then um, what I was thinking though is we might take his node and move it temporarily and see what the try, try to get somebody who knows what to do with the Wi-Fi and see if we can't debug it. And he hasn't been able to do that. I don't know what he's changed the computer. The only thing that doesn't change is the Wi-Fi and its location there, but it did the same thing at the other at the other uh, remote location. The one in Alvin? Yeah, wherever wherever it was. So he's still having trouble with it there. So I don't know what the what what's going on with that. Okay. Um, change computers, should, you know, whatever. So I think there's room for us to debug it. So whoever does it have to go Wi-Fi right now? Where he is now, he has to go Wi-Fi. He did he can't cable it from. Yeah, he's just got he the internet connection. He can't. He can't do the. Wifi. Not where it is now. Okay. Good. I hope so. It doesn't have a router. Or it doesn't have a hard 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 wire on. But at your home or my home or whatever, that would be a problem. All right, if you have any questions, report. So, so we run he run know, he says it's got a 60% um, reliability, which is too low, I think, for us. So, uh, so we'll set the goal of having within the next couple of months the um, the portable node set up. I, I wanted to set that up anyway um, for, for, for various purposes, and I got the radius, which is good. So I got 60 watt DAC radio, that should be enough to overpower any hands that we got. And then we can just you know, get the repeater. Yeah, we can use that. You know, I have, I have an antenna and jackery and all that. You know, we can play around with that. Okay. So it'll be an all, all of the above solution. We'll work on his repeater, try to debug it, but then we'll set up the backup. Yeah, I'll get with Rick Broussard and the other, the other technicians and we'll try to see if we can't get that going. Yeah, a good backup is a good deal. We don't have one. Now, uh, last item, and then we'll adjourn, is I've got time today. My truck is out here in the parking lot. I've got a, I've got a, a, a dual band 
radio in it. If anybody wants to get on the air, you know, new guys, just follow me out to the truck. We'll get you on the air. You have candy in the truck. Candy. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, my, uh, my, 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 my camping buddy, he and I have been camping together for over 30 years out in the hill country. His son saw me out there with my rig, a couple pieces of wire strung in the trees, come down with his balance line into my tuner and talking into deep north Saskatchewan and then on into Yukon. And he went and got his technician license. And he was up there again the last time I was there. Has it been on the air? No. I'm a little afraid. I want to do it with you. Okay. So, so because the uh, the band was going flaky, I got in my truck. I gave him my handheld. He went about a half acre away, and we talked. He said, "Now, how was my procedure? How was my protocol?" He, he's ex-military, so he's used to the military procedure. I said, "That's fine. Just don't say we'll go." Because that's what will comply. Roger, okay. Do not say 10 4. But coach him through that. <laughs> and uh, so now he's uh, he was driving around, saw an abandoned house about a block from his place with a 40 foot tower in the back. He says, I'm contacting the owner, see if I can just go get that out of his way. That's how you do it. One last thing. How many people here would do one uh, net control? Just do one, whatever. How many people here do one? I did one last uh, a couple weeks ago. Don't take on one net control to be the net control operator. Just one, one for the year. I got to crawl in my attic for the next ten hours. Look, well, we'll we'll crawl in your attic. <laughs> Just so that you don't have to complain about it. <laughs> a couple weeks ago, nobody was on, so picked it up. Absolutely. That's what you do. All right. I would, but that's my shop too many nights, so I can't. Yeah. I'm taking on you. I, I already do enough. Yeah. So. Yes, you well, do. I'll, I'll, you I'll, do. I'll, I'll take. I'll take a, uh, You know, if we're if we're thin, I'll I'll take it. Well, Thomas well, picked up an extra one every now and then. I have uh, Martin. I think I heard you do it one time, didn't you? No. Yeah. I'll. I'll. Hal, I'll do one. Right. Yeah. Well, like I said, if the whole, if everybody in the club did two, that's forty weeks. Yeah. You know, that would be you know for the year. You know, if everybody, you know, if everybody, you have a script. You don't have to make it yeah. up. So that, that's yeah, what I was hoping. I was going to say, I, I need a script. Yeah, no, we got the script. The script's on the web page. It's in English, though. You're going to have to translate. Oh, yeah. It's, it's in American. American. It's in American. We'll, we'll throw in a couple uh, extra O's and U's. And yeah, that's right, yeah. Can we, we can call them vowels for all the shoes. Martin, the most trouble I got into in high school was when I asked him why I had to take two foreign languages. What are you talking about? You only have to take one. No, no, no. You, t you gave me a choice between French uh, German and Latin. I chose Latin, and then I have to take English. I speak Texan. <laughs> oh, I get in trouble. <laughs> okay, guys, right. thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, guys, bus, bus tables, yep. chairs underneath. Thanks, guys. Hey, we want to thank uh, Ben and Dexter for. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Where's Wilmer? Thank you.